Welcome to Rock Vegas, everybody. Uh, the draft is over. Well, it's not over yet, but the Raiders ended a long time ago. They ended, like, at the beginning of the day. <laughs> uh, didn't have any picks past the fourth round. So they're they're done. They've been done for a while. I waited off, I hold, held off on recording just in case they traded, like, Gabe Jackson later, uh, got a late-round pick or something. I, I waited. But uh, I, as soon as I saw the tweets that Mike Mayock was on a conference call, uh, <laughs> kind of a press conference type thing, I was like, all right, we're done. So uh, kind of went out with a bang, I will say. Uh, the two fourth-round picks, I, I'm, I, I'm a fan. And I, I will say, and I'm going to start with the first guy here, uh, the Raiders traded up, I, I believe, with the Lions at the beginning of the day. They traded up, and uh, they, I mean, they gave up their fifth round for him. It, it was something I at the time when I just saw that like trade and they were on the clock I'm like oh no like trading up we we, don't have, we hardly have any picks I was trying to get some more picks today trade one of those fourth and, and move back in my head and then I said okay well who's it for I, I got a little nervous thinking it was it was a quarterback um even though it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world but with only two picks left I, I kind of wanted to try to steal another starter like we did in the fourth round last year um a couple times and so I got nervous and then I the pick came in and it said John Simpson and I did, I mean, I did the Snoop Dogg, the who? I, I did, I did that. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm ashamed to say it. I didn't do a lot of O-line scouting this year, especially interior O-line. Um, and when I say scouting, I use that term loosely. Scouting to me is uh, hitting my wax pen while I stare at YouTube, non-All-22 film. <laughs> so uh, that's what I mean when I say scouting. But uh, O-line is tough to scout anyways, tough to project. Like, it's not something that, like, the, av- the like, obsessed but average knowledge fan like myself can really look at and and project because there's so many guys like like chance warmack and guys like that where we just thought oh slam dunk they that's a safe pick in the first round we always think all linemen are good in the first round uh and they bust all the time so um when they took it i was like man really and uh the more and more i I thought about it it made sense and and they're again i i Say take the take the grades of the draft picks from the media. I take I say take them with a grain of salt because all they're doing is looking at their big board and and grading it kind of objectively. But it seemed like everybody liked John Simpson. I didn't really see someone go, oh god, cl- classic Raiders reach. I didn't see that. So um, it seemed like the trade up was warranted at least for the value of the player, which that's cool because even though you might. Like okay, say we reached like how we reached last year for Farrell. That was a reach. You can't argue that it was a reach. Now, I see the people's logic that say, hey, if he's great, then it wasn't a reach. I'm like, no, it, it still was. It just didn't matter. You know what I mean? It's still a reach when you could have got him later. So it didn't seem like that's what happened with John Simpson. Um, he definitely fits what the Raiders do. They run they run power, and and they like big guys. A massive offensive line. He's huge. I think he's at 330. He, he, he's got heavy hands. Um, I believe there were a couple scouts or – you know, Twitter people that were saying he's got like meat hooks for hands, like just heavy hands and and does damage. Um, they're saying maybe his footwork might be a could, might be a little slow, but I do think he's in the right system for a guy with slow footwork. We like power, power and, and hand and uh, you know, good hands. And uh, I think he's, <laughs> I, I would say he's learning under the right people, but uh, let's make sure Incognito doesn't pull a uh, a Jonathan Martin. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Um, but no, I'm kidding a little, a little bit. Uh, if incognito is as good as everybody's saying he's been, I think he's going to learn from, uh, maybe two really good guards, uh, in Gabe Jackson, but we'll see what happens with Gabe and incognito. But, uh, that's good. Um, the John Simpson pick, I always like getting better on the offensive line. I'll come back to what that means later for the 2020 death chart and maybe beyond that. But, uh, the next pick was uh meek robertson and we we stayed back i think it was at what is that 140 i want to say um we stayed back and i kind of wanted to trade back i saw robertson was still on the board but i was like man we got to get another pick i i I was just in gather pick mode today you know i and but we're a seven and nine team right we were seven and nine team last year and i don't think we outperformed our talent i think that was about what we were could have could have been nine and seven that's kind of the bubble you're in when you're seven and nine there's usually a few things that could have happened that make you nine and seven so I was like, you know what? Let's just get some good players. But I didn't think they were going to take Robertson. I literally tweeted uh, <laughs> earlier. I literally put on Twitter as we were getting closer and closer to that pick, and it was our last pick, and we were kind of all anticipating maybe a trade, maybe picking up another pick by trading Gabe or PJ Hall, which I'm sorry, PJ Hall's not going to get you jack shit. <laughs> 
anybody who thought that, that that's just bless your heart but nobody's trading for pj hall that's the, we're the only one who spent good draft capital on him that's not going to happen twice um so it was oh yeah mr sir Ra- mr underscore sir underscore raider shout out k1 hayes uh i literally put on twitter i was like i don't think we're gonna draft robertson man it just it, you know in my head i'm thinking shit he's gonna it's not gonna work out size wise i think they're gonna want a bigger slot corner um but then they draft him they drafted meek robertson uh if you've been listening if you're one of the four people that's been listening uh uh for a while and especially first couple episodes i did a huge thing on uh 10 guys i love for the draft just 10 guys that i wanted didn't didn't care you know pr- i tried to keep it day two and beyond um even though there were a couple guys that ended up going first round in there but i really wanted a meek robertson and brian edwards we got two of them we never draft my guys <laughs> we never do and I'm, I'm wrong I mean it's not like I'm saying oh man you gotta draft my guys because I'm right that's not you know that's not entirely true so I but um Meek Robertson oh actually the last time we drafted my guy was I believe Amari Cooper I, I think that's what it was I maybe there were some late round picks of guys that I really wanted I feel like there might have been one last year. I, I wanted Foster Moreau last year, but it wasn't like, oh, man, pounding the table. I just I, I wanted him. I, I mean, we needed another tight end, and we didn't know about Waller yet. So that that was maybe my guy. But Cooper was like the one where I was like, since day one, since day one of like the pre-draft process, I'm like, we got to get Cooper, get a number one receiver. At the time, I thought we had some amazing quarterback on our hands. I'll get to him later. So, Amik Robertson, Louisiana Tech, five foot eight, one eighty eight. I think that's what he's listed at, one eighty eight. And, uh, but he, it, it's it's our Patrick Beverly, right? I, I did say that it's, it's our Patrick Beverly. I said that last night on the podcast. I, I d- didn't have a pro comp for him. Uh, I guess if I had a, a, an NFL pro comp, it still wouldn't even be on the defensive side of the ball. It would be like Steve Smith of wide receivers. Um, just because. Steve Smith is like almost the same build as him and well Steve Smith was a little thicker than that but um kind of the same thing where he's like if Steve Smith was tall I don't know if Steve Smith has has the career he has right I think if Steve Smith being short allowed him to play you know the way he plays I don't think he'd be as like in your face right and Steve Smith is like that Draymond Green type attitude where if he's not pissed off and doing committing technicals he's probably not playing well so Amik Robertson in, is is super interesting, super exciting to me too, because a, a slot corner is like just as important as your boundary corners. It's almost becoming almost more important because they're starting to put bigger, faster, stronger guys in the slot. And yeah, I get it. We drafted a short guy, so maybe if people didn't know about Amik Robertson, they'd go, well, "What the fuck? Are we drafted a five eight corner for like you know what I'm saying?" But he's fast. He has a nose for the ball. He can. He can put you in a coffin when he puts that shoulder into you. It's it's crazy. Uh, watch his tape against Colin Johnson. Uh, I don't think Colin Johnson's that good. I don't think he uses his six five frame the way he should have used it. But there's no way a five eight corner should have been dogging him the way Amik Robertson was if if it wasn't for that corner being good. So he's explosive. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about what it means for the overall secondary. But it was a great pick. I think if you're going to not gather more picks, get your get. I think they've got best player available twice. Actually, Matt Miller did say that at Bleacher Report. And Matt Miller's very liberal with his grading. He gives us great, like, he gave us an A-plus for Henry Ruggs. And it's like, I don't even think most fans that are happy, like, most fans are happy with Ruggs. I don't know if they even give that pick an A-plus, man. <laughs> like, that's crazy. So he he gave that pick an A, and uh, his co-host gave him an A-plus. Uh, Connor, Connor Rogers, sorry. Gave him a, gave us an A-plus for it. And I... I most of the league is saying that PFF had him as like the best single coverage grade guy, like him and Arnett are close to the like top in single coverage and say what you will Raider fans about PFF. They're becoming more and more embraced by the NFL. So if that's how people are drafting, then PFF is winning, whether you think they are or not. So, uh, Amik Robertson, he could start nickel corner. I, not that I think he's experienced. I think there'd be some growing pains. There's going to be penalties. Um, I'll talk about that later when you combine everybody together. I, there's going to be some penalties. There's going to be some after the play, unsportsmanlike conduct, number 26, defense. Like, there's going to be that. I mean, and fuck, I hope that's not in crucial moments. Um, and it's not going to be just Robertson, trust me, that's doing that on this defense. We we want attitude on defense. We have to take what comes with it. But uh, I would rather have 
junkyard dogs in my secondary that fuck up every once in a while and play too hard every once in a while. And uh, that's up to our coaching, too. Our coach is going to have to rein that in. Um, I I hope our DB coach is able to. Um, I, I don't know much about him personally, but uh, I know he's kind of – he had to have said something about Arnett because he was Arnett's coach in 2018 there at uh, Ohio State. So he, ha- he has to be getting, like, I guess what he thinks are his guys. So – uh, it's up to him and, and Paul Gunther and guys like that to make sure that defense is disciplined. But I love that th- this guy is our best slot corner right now. I'll, I'll go out and say it. I know you can't project that well. I'm, I'll, there's a decent chance that I'm wrong, too. But over Joyner and Nixon, I, I think right now Robertson's better just on ability alone. Um, and I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, hopefully this means Joyner goes back to free safety, even though the Raiders are standing their ground on that. Um I would have liked to have had more picks, um, I, especially, man, the sixth, seventh round. I'm seeing guys that, like, I would see in, like, third round mocks to the Raiders, man. Like, I, I like Eno Benjamin, guys like that. Maybe not third round, but, like, fourth, fifth round. Guys like that, man, I, I, wish, I really wish we had more picks. But overall, I think the draft went well. It didn't start well for me. I, I really thought we got off to a, a poor start. Now, I said it last night, the Ruggs pick gets – gets validated by the other picks I think uh getting Brian Edwards I think Brian Edwards has can be a number one receiver and I, maybe Ruggs ends up getting an insane amount of targets but I do think he's going to be used like a Deshaun Jackson where he ends up kind of being the, the deep threat he might get four or five like targets a day thrown targets hopefully he gets more touches than that all right like handoffs and stuff but I think Brian Edwards could be the number one receiver for this team maybe not 2020 maybe 2021 but um him paired with rugs is awesome. I, I love it even more than I did last night after a few IPAs. <laughs> so I love it even more now. Um, so I do think we have a potential to have a really nice receiving core now. Um, we got better. You can't say we got worse. So that's always good when a seven and nine team that was, uh, you know, I, I won't I won't say fringe playoff, but there was a time <laughs> where the Raiders were over five hundred in the second half of the season. So. That's fringe to me, I guess, as far as talent. Uh, I, you know, I, there was definitely some. I would like to have had more picks to add more depth, you know, get some more special teams guys. But it is what it is. I, I don't. We don't get Robertson if that's the case. And and Robertson is probably my favorite pick in the draft. But I do like him and Brian Edwards. Probably one A, one B. But um, I thought it, I thought it was good. I, the Muse and the Arnett pick is my problem. Uh, Arnett more than anything. And I and look. I'll say this right now. The arguments I get in on Twitter, I think we're arguing two different things. I say that Arnett was a reach, and then everyone tells me how much he fits the scheme. Okay. I think you're right. I won't argue with that at all. I, 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 Ted Wynn had been talking about that since before the draft. I don't see how that's even a debate now. I, I trust Ted Wynn. When I, when I see the all-22 camera angle and I see his avi right there, I, he could – he could tell me that yeah, teams need to line up backwards and turn their backs and run and backpedal in their routes and stuff. And I'll be like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, cool, Ted. Yeah, that's that's our scheme now. I would listen. But uh, shout out Ted, man. Ted, Ted was like one of the one of the best Twitter follows. I, I love I love the way he uh, he breaks. He just breaks down. He breaks down tape really well. He was like one of the first like guys who actually had all 22 footage and would actually like kind of give the audio to it and stuff. Always like that. So he he even said him and Eric Crocker. I remember were saying that Arnett is it fits the Raiders and he fits the Niners. So I'm I won't argue that with you. I still think it was a reach. I still th- I don't think the Niners were going to take him at all. Uh, maybe I, I I don't know. I I just don't think so. I think the Niners were going to get their wide receiver. In my opinion, I think that's what they were going to do. I think Ayuk was their guy. Um, Ayuk or like a Hamler, depending on they were going to get a speed wide out. I think I don't, I don't, I didn't see another team get in front of them. And then today, I think we feel it, right? I, it's fine. Y- you're right. If Arnett ends up being good, I'm not going to care that we picked him at 19. I'm not going to care about him, just that isolated player. But today, when you have, you could have moved back like two spots and just been like, give me a sixth rounder, fifth rounder. Even if you got hosed on the trade value, we would have had another pick today and still got Arnett. And that could have been another guy we added. Wouldn't have had to like shuffle around in the fourth round, maybe. You never know. So I just in the first round, it's weird. Like Mayock, 
my, my criticism of it, because Arnett, I think we all know that, like, Arnett seems like the, the Mayock pick. It's like they split it, you know, they split the first round. Gruden's like, let me get 12, you do whatever the fuck you want at 19. Okay. So, I think Arnett, I think, I'm sorry, I think Mayock, what he needs to do is, like, just get the, you know, get the, uh, butterflies out like in the first round it's like he gets butterflies it's like he's this is my guy i have to take him i have to take him and then like in the third round he's just like dude i'm chilling i'm just i'm just i'm a buzzsaw through this draft i'm just i want this guy give me this guy give me this guy give me this guy and he just runs through it it's like is he is he nervous in the first round does he does he need to warm up like i said is he is he like steph curry where he's gonna you know rattle out three his first like five three-pointers and be like one for eight at the half but he makes that one right before the half comes out third quarter and just drops like 26 in the quarter like is that maybe that's what Mayhawk does maybe we'll just start we'll be that team that trades out of the first round like like the Patriots do all the time maybe that's what happens like when when we're like a good well-oiled machine or something like that maybe that's what ends up happening it's it's really weird the way the way Mayock does the first round as opposed to the way he does the rest of the draft the rest of the draft he's just like best player available it seems like and he and he's good at maneuvering in and out of the rounds he's, he's actually really good at like trading back and still getting the guy that he wanted and I mean that's what he says it happens but it, it seems like he genuinely wants these guys it doesn't seem like they're panicking but in the first round they're like nobody would trade with us we had to take Arnett. We had to do this. It's like, oh, that's fine. If Arnett ends up being the pick, I just want some more picks in return. So when you see the Khalil Mack pick, or when you see the Khalil Mack trade, and I don't want to remind anybody of it because we're already sick of it. Khalil Mack was my favorite player I ever saw wear a Raider uniform. Still miss him on the team. Like, uh, I understand that trading him for multiple players is good, but when you when you isolate what we got for him, it's Josh Jacobs. Josh Jacobs might be the best running back in the league, but again, it's a running back right now. It's a, a, a it's a position, and it's not anything Jacobs is doing. It's not his fault at all. I'm glad we have him, and he does create a lot of his own yardage, which is really nice. So I do think he's more valuable than other running backs, but he's a running back. So we have him, Brian Edwards, and Arnett. If Brian Edwards and Arnett are good, we crush the Mac trade. Crush it. There's no chance. If they're not good, if they're even just like league average, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not. I'm not sure we win. Now the Bears did us a favor. They drafted Cole Komet with the Khalil Mack pick, and it's like, I'm a Notre Dame fan. I watched Cole Komet. We churn out tight ends like nothing at Notre Dame. Kyle Rudolph, uh, John Carlson, uh, Tyler Tyler Eifert, yeah, and uh, a couple other guys too that I'm blanking on. But we 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 churn out tight ends there. Cole Komet, nothing special. So. I think the Bears kind of screwed up, and they already have like six tight ends. They're, they're in like I, I'm guessing they did it to like trigger Gruden. It's like, look, man, here's a tight end you can't have, pal. Is that is that what happened? Because they definitely aren't holding up their end of the deal. And if they don't win with Khalil Mack, it probably wasn't worth it if you look at the results only thing. But you can't say that if Arnett and them don't work out. If if say Edward Edwards, I think has a really low or a really high floor, so I do see him at least being like a really good like two or three receiver in the league, but it's say he's not healthy or, you know what I mean? He, and he's hurt all the time. We might get washed in this trade. It's nowhere near over yet. So it's still weird that people are like trying to say we won or lost. We got two rookies and a second year player out of it. So, um, I'm just saying you could have turned that, that pick into a, like maybe another pick, right? If you trade back and got Arnett, that was my point. So then you could add another player to that, that mix, turn Khalil Mack into, into four players, right? So it would technically be two players and a four players. Giving up that second was still unspeakable to me. Unspeakable. I was one, that was the worst part of that trade, even more than losing my favorite player. <laughs> it was the giving up the second. That was brutal. Here, this guy, just take this take this scrub off our hands. We'll even give you a second to do it. Oh, yeah, it's Cleo Mac. Yeah, this that scrub. That's who I'm talking about. Jeez. Yeah, how, tough sell, right? Fuck. Tough sell for the Bears. Twist my arm. I remember. Uh, man. Uh, yeah. Anyways, let's get away. Let's get away from that. Um, that's the thing though. Uh, and, and even getting back to Mayock where Mayock saying, I had to take this guy in the first round. I had to have him, had to have him. Nobody would trade with me. Actually, he said he denied trades for Arnett. It kind of reminds me of Re Reggie's first draft where he was like, I'm getting DJ Hayden one way or another. I think Arnett's better than DJ Hayden. I think he fits the scheme better. I think we have a better scheme than what we had. I think we, I don't remember if we had like Jason Tarver still there or I, I'm trying to think of who the, DC was 
during that uh, Dennis Allen. <laughs> Who was it? wasn't wasn't Norton Jr. yet. He came in for Del Rio. I, I'm blanking on that. But uh, whoever that was at the time, I don't even know what the hell that scheme was. It wasn't Jason Tarver, though. I, it was somebody after that. But we take DJ Hayden. And I remember, like, I remember like, there was talks, like, saying, hey, DJ Hayden's going to go a little higher than you think in the draft. And, like, the only highlight would be him, like, almost dying at Houston. And it was, like, his own defensive guy. Or I don't know if it was a wide receiver. was running into, like, on a non-contact practice or some shit. And they were, like, got headbutt in the chest. And they're like, yeah, you know, if uh, DJ Hayden's heart holds up, he should be good. And it's like, that's, yeah, that's exactly what I want out of my 12th overall pick is if his heart holds up. Yeah, we, that happened with Mo Hurst, but at least Mo Hurst was a fifth rounder. You could piss that away and not hate your life, you know. Um, but damn, man, it just seems like one of these things where it's like Arnett has to work. He's a scheme fit. Just because a guy's a scheme fit does not mean he's good either. That's the thing. Right? Like. Cleveland Farrell is a scheme fit. I don't think he's particularly good. I think he can maybe be average. I think his flo- floor is lower, which is nice. Um, I guess that's it's kind of why we draft all those Clemson guys, right? Maybe they think the floor is like if they their failure is like still kind of a success for the team. Maybe that's kind of their thing because they they know they come from a winning program, and you know it's not a bad program to just latch onto and draft everybody from. Uh, who knows? Maybe we trade the farm for Lawrence next year if uh, number four doesn't get his shit together. Who knows? just saying throwing that out there but with Clemson uh with Clemson's funny man it's a lot of Clemson fans I think like are becoming like kind of not Raider fans but they're kind of like they get to watch like six of their guys play on Sunday on the same channel so that's and whoever's on the other team from Clemson too right so I think a lot of them like follow the Raiders I saw one guy commit an atrocity it's on my Twitter I, I posted it some Clemson fan and maybe it was a Raider fan just playing a sick joke a sick joke. They made like a, a purple and orange uh like Raider shield logo and I was it made me sick. I had to like put on my little digital eye strain glasses when I looked at it. It was rough. It's like, man, I think like Clemson guys are happy to be Raiders simply for the fact that they're like, dude, I get I finally get a good uniform? Holy shit. They're just, like they're they're happy to be here. They're like, please don't put me back in that purple and orange bullshit. That white one is okay, but the white jerseys, everybody with all whites and like, uh, you know, one little color stripe, like a like an orange stripe, that's easy. Like Cleveland Browns do that, and that's a fine uniform. They're like solid colored, like colorful uniforms are horrendous, man. So um, you're welcome, Clemson, uh, Clemson Tiger fans. You get to watch your team play in like a nice uniform. Watch your guys that you like uh, like to see play in nice colored uniforms. So best uniforms in the league, if I say so myself. Um, so. Again, we should have traded back in round one. That was my big thing. Tanner Muse, I can't I think it was a reach. I think I think he was valued later, like in the one fifties. We took him when we took him. Whatever. The Clemson Mayock started seeing orange again. Mayock saw orange and turned into whatever the fuck gets angry by seeing orange or turned on by seeing orange and he's like, click, 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 smash the Tanner Muse button. Smash it. And then his name's fucking Tanner. That knocks you down around for me. Like, damn. Tanner? Like again, he should. That's a that's a Mormon name, Tanner Muse. I don't think he's Mormon. I think he's one of those like guy that only wears sleeveless shirts and like fucking walks around with a big tub of like protein powder all day. He seems like one of those type of guys. Like he's like, oh man, like I can't wear sandals. He he seems like one of those type of guys. But yeah, it's it, but it, his name is like ride my bikes and knock on people's doors with my little helmet and shirt and tie, Mormon. So. Uh, definitely not feeling that, but, um, if he's going to cover tight ends, that's fine. So that one, I don't really know about that one. Didn't piss me off as much. I just kind of rolled my eyes a little bit when they picked him. but he's athletic. So if he's going to, he seemed like a reach. That's the only reason I'm not super excited about the pick. If we got him day three, I'd be like, cool, perfect. But I thought there was definitely, I think some better picks to be made in the third round there. I'm not looking at the draft, but I, this draft was loaded, um, at least on paper. So Muse does seem like a reach, but if he's going to cover tight ends, um, kind of shadow Kelsey and, and pick them up in, in coverage, I, I think that's well worth it. So that's fine. And he said he's a special teams war daddy. I don't even – what the hell is that, by the way? I, that didn't get enough attention. Special teams war daddy? It sounds like some bondage shit. What the fuck? So uh, Tanner Muse, I'm pulling for you, but I, I will make fun of nobody harder than if you suck. If Tanner Muse sucks, there's nobody I'm gonna make fun of more. I'm just saying. It's just it's it comes with the look. Trust me. Look at my picture. I 
Happens to me too. It comes with the look, comes with the territory. But uh, yeah, I'm on your head. So Muse, sure, that's fine. But I love, I, I mean, look, the rugs pick, I, I can, I can be talked into. I already have been talked into. Uh, Edwards was was a smash hit to me. Love Lynn Lynn Bowden. Lynn Bowden's gonna be awesome. Um, I, I really think he's gonna be good. I don't think he's Braxton Miller. Braxton Miller came into my head for a second. I got that evil thought out of here. I don't think he's Braxton Miller. I think he's way more polished as a wide receiver. So I, I definitely think we're looking at more of like a Randall Antoine Randall L, who was ahead of his time. If Antoine Randall L is quarterback now, he's like he, he might he you know he might have the career Lamar Jackson had. Maybe not, but you know doesn't have the arm Lamar Jackson had. But you could run like an offense with him and stuff at the helm. I think so. I don't know if you could do that with Lynn Bowden, but he could be emergency quarterback. I'll tell you. I, I mean, I'll put him out there before I see Nate Peterman. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Lynn Bowden. You know, you don't even have to carry three quarterbacks, even though Gruden will. He's obsessed with it. You don't have to waste your 50, what is it, 56-man roster now or something. But you don't have to waste a spot on a third quarterback. Gruden will, and it'll be Peterman, I'm sure, or Kaiser, whoever wins that battle amongst the 10 quarterbacks we'll have in camp. But – um, ah, lost my train of thought for a second, but, uh, yeah, non- nonetheless, uh, I think I just, I got mad that we didn't have day three picks, you know? Oh, I know where I was. I'm sorry. Lynn Bowden, uh, Lynn Bowden was great. Edwards was great. Uh, Muse was, uh, was a bit of a reach hit. I thought we hit home runs on the fourth round. And if that's how you're going to end, that's how you're going to end. Okay. Uh, the only thing is, is just, you got to be smart with your day three picks and, Obviously, I don't mean today, right? I think we were smart with our two day three picks. We should have had way more. That's my problem. Uh, Trevor Davis is one of our picks, right? Look at the guys in the draft that were drafted in the sixth round. Um, not all of them, of course, but there were still some like decent players in the sixth round, especially at like skill positions. And then tell me, would you rather have had a mm, th- three quarters of a season of Trevor Davis or that? That was the dumbest trade. Like, seriously, that was, that was so dumb. At the time, I was like, ah, whatever, they're going to hand him the ball. He had that that wide receiver reverse touchdown, and he had a nice punt return, too, uh, I think against Indy. And I was like, oh, all right, like yeah, if that's what he's going to do. Gruden knows something I don't. But then he almost fucking lost the Bears game. And we traded of draft pick to replace Dwayne Harris. That's that's what we did. So, to me, it's it's – it's just not a good use of day three picks. Calais Campbell was traded for a day three pick. If you're going to do that, like, go big, man. So I don't want to see them doing this anymore. Guess what? We don't have a fifth round pick next year because of Zay Jones. I don't know if Zay Jones makes the football team this year. Gruden might be seeing, you know, Gruden might be having a stopwatch around his neck, Al Davis style, and just time in 40s all day and being like look Aguilar's Aguilar staying uh Gafford staying um when we're doing Aguilar Gafford Ruggs Edwards and uh Williams and I don't know the Bowden maybe if he ends up being a wide receiver sounds like he's a running back and he might tell uh Zay Jones to get lost and then we don't have a fifth round pick next year and I don't know it just you don't think about it at the time you want to win I don't know how many wins that got us the Trevor Davis pick, you know what I mean? Look, I know it's a six-round pick. I thought we could add at least a special teams player in this draft and have him for a couple years. Um, again, I won't cry about it. I thought it was a good draft. I give it a, I give it a solid B. Uh, solid B, and it could easily be an A if Arnett is what everyone's saying he is and arguing with the PFF people about. Uh, so what does this mean for the team? Uh, the, dep- the, the depth chart is a lot better now. Um, wide receiver looks great. Uh, secondary is night and day different. Uh, you know, I, I don't consider secondary a strength yet. I think people are getting a little too excited about some of these picks. I, I still think it is kind of a weakness on this team. But uh, there's definitely a lot more athleticism. Getting Abram back is like having another first-round pick this year. So that was nice. Um, that'll be nice to have him. I think, God damn that secondary, there's going to be some personal fouls. You got Abram. Arnett. Anyone see Arnett decleating Mike Mayock's son? That was nuts. And then Mayock's like, yep, I want him. Does Mike Mayock hate his son? No, I'm kidding. But <laughs> he's like, yeah, that's my guy. All right, cool. Thanks for hitting that little fucking snarky bastard. <laughs> but uh, you, 
there's going to be some after the uh, you know after the whistle nonsense happening on this team. Which hey, that's the Raider way, right? That's that's how we that's how we do things. Um, I don't consider the secondary strength yet. I still don't buy our free safety position. I think we have names and people like names people have heard of, but I don't, I think we're going to be like cursing them halfway through the year. Um, so I'm a little concerned about that. Uh, I like the linebacking core a lot. Um, would have liked to have picked up a day three linebacker. Like I, I would have loved to have gotten Troy die. Right. You know what I mean? Like found a way to get like Troy die. That's why we keep these picks, man. Like just somebody to develop depth is good. Depth is really good. And, uh, speaking of depth, what do you think happens with Gabe Jackson? So I I wanted to trade him for a day three pick. If they could have got a fifth round for him, I pulled the trigger instantly. But now just keep him. We're not paying it. We're not gonna pay anybody else. I don't I don't think unless they're gonna try to sign Clowney or something. I don't know. Like I know they want another edge rusher. They wouldn't be asking about Yannick. So maybe there's somebody on the market that that they want to throw some money at and clearing Gabe out allows that to happen. But why not keep him? Um, you you draft Simpson, but why start him? You got a guy that can. He says he prefers to play left guard, anyways, which I, that's where Incognito is. So that it's a bit interesting. He did say that. That's something to keep. He said he would play right guard, but you know, in his mind, he I guess it sounds like he wants to stay on the left side. So I don't. I'm sure he's going to end up being kind of like a swing guard because Incognito is 37 and uh, Gabe is injured a lot and uh, not. He's regressing, you know. I love Gabe Jackson. That was a great pick back back then. And that that O line was so fun to watch with him, Assembly, Hudson, Penn, uh even Austin Howard was getting busy from time to time. So the the reason uh the reason I, I want to keep that is because it's like, man, when you have depth on the offensive line, that is a luxury. You see all these te- there's so many teams that cannot even get like three positions filled on the offensive line adequately. Look what the Jets had to do in free agency. They had to buy an entire O line and draft Mackay Becton, and you still don't really know if it's if it's enough. So I keep him. Just have depth on the O line. We're so used to as like Raider fans, where we're like, we drafted a guy, now he has to start. It's like, yeah, if he earns it. Now, like now we have actual starters at positions in theory, and enjoy that. That's what good teams do. They draft guys and they don't necessarily hand them the keys right away. When you do that, when you're starting all your draft picks every year, that's because you're bad. Worked out decent for us last year, but we didn't start those draft picks because they beat people out in camp, like starting level NFL talent. That's not why we started those guys. We had to. So don't start John Simpson on opening, you know, opening night, whenever the hell that is, opening day, opening night. Don't you don't do, have to do that. So start Gabe Jackson. Hey, look, Gabe Jackson gets hurt a lot. Guess what? Guess who we have if Gabe Jackson gets hurt. John Simpson. Guess what happens if Richie Incognito rips off a face, rips off someone's helmet, like throws it in the stands and hits a kid or something? We have John Simpson, right? <laughs> Let's keep our depth. Um, I I do like our speed in the in the in the wide receiver core. Uh, I D line was something that was another reason I wanted some day three picks. I would have loved to have bet on some freakish athletes like some Max. We're gonna use this a lot because we found Max Crosby in the fourth round. But let's not just say like. Let's find Max Crosby. Looks, that's a lug. That doesn't happen all the time. But betting on athleticism can get that for you every so often. So I would have liked to have accrued some more day three picks so we could have used them on the D line. Gets We have a pretty good, not pretty good, but it's a good enough starting defensive line right now, especially if you put Nassib in as depth and and uh, and Collins and Hurst and all that. It's, it's, it's okay. It gets the job done. If the coverage holds up, it's going to be fine. So... I, I would have liked to have had a day three pick just to just to draft like a crazy freak, uh, you know, no guarantee, but just a guy that if you strike gold, it's like, man, it is like having a Max Crosby. I remember I remember there was a guy when we had Dennis Allen as our coach, the glory days, as I call him, the uh, it, they drafted this guy out of Virginia. And I think his name was like Max Vallis. The Raiders during that time were weird with their defensive line picks. They're like, oh, this guy's in England and never played football before. Let's get him. Yeah, Jack Crawford, a oh, British accent. And, oh, you mean to tell me there's an offensive lineman that we can get that with a British accent that was playing soccer two years before this? Let's get him, too. Menelik Watson. We already have Hayden. Let's get another slam dunk in Menelik Watson. 
Those, we drafted way too many British people back in the day. If if I go to camp and I show up and the fucking offensive lineman has a, a British accent, I'm like, well, this what is this, the replacements? I'm out of here. What the fuck? I'm... <laughs> That was that man. Sometimes we go down dark paths as Raider fans. We're I'm ready for some winning. I don't know about you guys, but um, I think the big thing we can take out of all this, and if you're a big fan of the guy, you should also this should also be your thinking is okay. Now it's time to win. It's time to win. Number four. It's time to win. There's no excuses. There weren't as many excuses last year as people like to say there were. I think he had more offensive weapons than. You know, a lot of quarterbacks do, honestly. I mean, that run game is a quarterback's friend. He he leaned on it a lot. I mean, it's that we had a great run game last year, and and Waller is a great tight end. And you know, if there are quarterbacks that win with good running backs, good tight ends, right? And uh, it's put up or shut up time. This is his job to lose. It's obvious that they don't, you know. I've I've said this ad nauseum. They brought Mariota in for a reason. It's obvious they don't trust him beyond this year. And even then, I, who knows, right? There could be something crazy that happens in training camp. But um, I will say this. I'm going to give my official take, my official stance on Carr, because I feel like you have to do it as a Raider fan. And that's what you're held to as, like, a Raider fan from other fans. It's like, how do you feel about Carr? Because, honestly, like, that's the difference between me on Twitter. A follow and an unfollow is, like, if I see, like, heart heart emojis around like car's name i'm like oh jesus christ there's bodies in this guy's trunk Ugh. what the fuck but but, okay let me not talk shit here's his good quality this is what i like about Derek Carr. this is what i like about having Derek Carr in 2020 one we're in a pandemic and you can't learn a new offense in a pandemic at least on the field right it's not gonna happen we're gonna have a shortened off season i'm pretty sure so car knows the offense I don't think he executes it to that high of a degree, or at least the degree that it should be executed at. But nonetheless, he knows the offense. It's another. It's like having another teacher, for for just the X's and the O's. Uh, two, gets rid of the ball quick. Doesn't take hits. That doesn't take a lot of hits. Uh, he doesn't turn the ball over a lot, right? I I I think some of his turnovers are fucking brutal, though. Uh, Rams game, uh, 2018 opener, the uh, one that slipped out of his hand right to the linebacker. That was funny not but uh he he does get rid of the ball quick if his first read is is open he makes a good throw he's an accurate passer um i i think he throws the ball well down the field when he's when he feels like he can like when he i don't know i i I think every time he throws it down the field it looks fine he's got a good arm he's accurate with it but so, so I, I didn't see a better option over him. So that's fine. I'm rolling into 2020 with Derek Carr as, as our quarterback. This should be, in theory, the best roster he's ever had um, when you take into account run game, wide receiver, and uh, – because, uh, look, Josh Jacobs shits on Latavius Murray. And uh, so that's what I think sets this over the 2016 lineup he had. Well, they We probably had more polished receivers in 2016, uh, at least the top two. But – I think we have way more depth at wide receiver right now on paper. Um, so it should be the best thing he has. And uh, so the, the thing, but my take is that he's a league average quarterback. That's why the way I see Derek Carr is he's a league average quarterback, which is really weird why he's so polarizing, like on, on Raiders Twitter. He's so polarizing, but I'm so lukewarm on him. Like I'm not, I'm not excited by him being the team's quarterback. But I, I, I mean, I don't think we're like in hell. I think some, I see people talking shit about Carr on the internet all the time. I think a lot of times, and maybe I'm wrong here. Maybe they do legitimately think he's the worst quarterback in the NFL. I think it's just fun to troll because the stands are like, the stands like are window lickers, man. And if you don't know what a window licker is, just think about it. And uh, they, they are insane. Like it's, it's insane. I'll get to them later. But his bad qualities are, he, he's. He had the same 40 time as Johnny Manziel, and you'd never know. Holy shit. Like, Johnny Manziel was fast. Derek Carr ran the same 40 time. But, dude, you have to, like, pull start this guy like an old-school lawnmower, man. Like, you have to, like, pull start the guy before he gets going. It's like he's running in quicksand for his first three steps, and then he takes off. Um, he doesn't improvise very well. And I don't really like his footwork at all anyways. Like, anytime he, – he's always tripping over stuff in the pocket. Like, um, you're – you see him kind of like his pocket awareness isn't really that good. He 
takes he holds on to the he either gets rid of the ball right away or holds on to it way too long and doesn't really sense the pressure that much and he's had a good o-line more often than he hasn't so god forbid if he had like what sam darnold has has had in in the jets and uh you know what russell wilson had in in uh in seattle so and the, but my biggest problem with him oh another thing i can't stand i don't know if anybody else notices it but dude he like he throws like change-ups on out out routes if anyone ever noticed that he floats the ball to the outside and it's so fucking nerve-wracking when it's in the air i mean again it's still accurate but it's like dude rip that thing in there like he made that great throw against detroit this year where he threaded it like over the uh linebacker's arm and then like underneath the the defender that was over the top it was beautiful tyrell williams caught it he makes throws like that he had to throw that game against richard where it was just richard on that wheel route and he just dropped it in the bucket it was like double coverage but then sometimes he just like when he's in his own head and it's got to be a mental thing. He like floats everything to the outside. Like he doesn't trust it. And everything looks like it's going to be a pick six. And then it gets batted down or, you know what I mean? The wide receiver is not timing his, you know, foot drag right and stuff. When between him and Cooper not being able to drag his feet, that used to be really frustrating. Um, yeah, I think he just gives up on plays too f- fast. And a lot of people attribute that to Gruden's offense. But I, I think that's kind of always been his MO other than 2016. Um, 2016, he just had a set of brass ones. I think he finally felt good. And then he hit the reset button after the injury. So, um, he also can't tune the noise out on the field and, or off the field, excuse me. I don't think he, he looks like he's in control on the field, right? Like he looks like he knows what he's doing. He leads the team. He's pretty good at the end of the game. If he, if he doesn't take us out of the game by the fourth quarter and we're still in it, he's usually pretty good. Usually runs a, a good two minute drill, but it's so weird. Like on Twitter, he reminds me, you know who he reminds me of? Cause he, every year he does this, like not listening to anything this year. I'm all about winning. This is about God, family, football and football is, is, you know, I'm, I, I don't want to listen to none of the haters and all that stuff. It's like, good. You should have never let your brothers fight for you on, on Twitter. I mean, that, that sucks too, but like, let them handle it. You know, he's like screenshotting shit and sending it to them and having them handle it. There's no way he's not. And I'm sorry, dude. Show me a great quarterback that does stuff like that. Baker Mayfield already – if Baker Mayfield's going to decide if he learned that lesson or not because he's going to end up doing the same thing but hypercharged. And I think Baker Mayfield's good too and could be great, has the tools. But Baker Mayfield, you notice he, he kind of shut up a little more lately. He's kind of just chilling, and I think he realized that. But, like, car, man, you got rabbit ears. When I was grew up playing baseball, that used to be the thing. Whenever you could rattle the pitcher from the dugout, talk shit about him, and then he started – throwing wild pitches and you know couldn't throw a slider right and stuff you call them rabbit ears you're like man I, I know you're listening to me even though I'm just barely even talking and it's like man he, it's like he hears everything it's like fucking Trump man like Trump you know damn don't make car president Jesus but um but really my number one thing is I'm starting to see this when I see these new this new crop of quarterbacks that come in the homes even like the guys that were there before car like Russell Wilson um people like that they they're good enough to make people around them better. And the problem with Carr is there are way too many things that have to be good to perfect for him to play above average football. Above average, I mean over 500. We've only been there once with him. So you, it's tough for me to say, like, look, you're the highest paid. He's not, I don't know if he's the highest paid guy anymore on the team, but at the time he was the highest paid guy on the team but he needed so much more for that money to ever be worth it, right? We needed high, you know, we would have to crush every draft pick. We would have to have, you know, four deep at wide receiver, four Hall of Famers at wide receiver. I, I'm, it's hyperbole, but you guys know what I'm saying. Perfect O-line, perfect run game. And then even then they'll be like, oh, the play calling. Shut up. He fucking controls shit at the line of scrimmage half the time. He can check out of plays. And let's be real. In the first 15 plays of the game are usually scripted. That's when the Raiders offense looks the best. I understand Gruden. I have my qualms with Gruden getting conservative in second half football. But the first 15 plays scripted by Gruden seem to be going pretty well. We go go up like 10-0 in the first five minutes of the game. We're like, sweet. And then all of a sudden, he just takes a shit and starts spiking, you know, third and 11, spiking it, you know, just stuff like that. Fourth, Fourth and two, let me throw this into the stands. There's way too much video evidence of that, too. So I'm just tired of having a quarterback where everything has to be perfect. 
right? I think you can go nine and seven, ten and six, and go on the run in the playoffs with Carr, but it is such a small possibility. And you can't have injuries through the year because one guy goes down and then all of a sudden it's like, well, we started, you know, Zay Jones today. Like, how could Carr have ever done anything? It's like, man, sometimes you have to. And look, I understand. I don't even – Carr's not Aaron Rodgers. Carr's not Tom Brady. Carr's not Peyton Manning. I, I don't need him to be that, but damn, man. we There's been a quarterback in every single draft better than him since he's been drafted. So this year's it, man. This year is it. Um, let's talk about his fans though, his fans. Cause I, at this point, it's like, whenever we criticize them, they say, well, then you're not a real fan. It's like, are you kidding me? I want my team to be good. I'm getting mad at the 38 and 55 quarterback. Like that's making me mad. He's making the most money on the team. And they're like, well, you're not a real fan. It's like, I'm not so sure you won't follow him to his next team, which, Hey, good riddance. Right? So his fans are so crazy. I have never seen, and and maybe I'm I'm not in enough like circles on social media for like their fan bases. So maybe there are guys like this for other teams. I have never seen a such a such a huge support system for a league average quarterback. A league average quarterback. And I, I'm honestly I'm being maybe a little nice with league average because sometimes it's not that. So like I don't are, are people taking Ryan Fitzpatrick? I mean we ironically like Ryan Fitzpatrick because he's funny to watch and it's hero ball and hilarious but like is anyone like don't talk shit about Ryan Fitzpatrick you don't know like nobody's doing that he Ryan Fitzpatrick didn't have anything to work with he went to Harvard like nobody's doing that that's always how I figure whenever I read pro car tweets they sound like kids stomping their feet I want to do it that's what it sounds like Tyrell Williams dropped it that's what it sounds like to me but the fans are so weird because Look, I'll tell you this. Say we do get rid of Carr this year, and we hit a home run in the draft. Let's say we get Trevor Lawrence next year. Let's say we hit a home run. It, it went bad, and we had we traded up to number one just like when the Rams got Jared Goff, right? Say say a team that doesn't need a quarterback has a pretty good quarterback has a has a bad year, and drafts uh like, like a Packers. Say the Packers get the number one overall pick next year. After this draft, I wouldn't be surprised. Holy shit, they fucked up. I I think. So say. They get the number one overall pick this year. They don't want Trevor Lawrence. We trade up and get Trevor Lawrence. And our fans, when they start standing like a good quarterback, there's going to be murders. There's going to be meet me in Temecula moments like the Kobe stuff. Rest in peace, Kobe. It's, it's going to be that type of stuff. Like, I'll fight you right now. We already almost do that with Carr. If we get somebody like Trevor Lawrence, there's going to be like buildings where like, Lawrence stands in Raider, you know, Raiders Lawrence stands can just have like a big building to go in and they all just post from like their own computers all day, like and just try to try to praise him on the internet all day and argue anyone that doubts him. You're gonna walk in, you're gonna be like, What's this? And it's some guy in like a linen a white linen sheet shirt and, and some sandals. Welcome, brother. Would you like something to drink? That's gonna be how our fan base is, because we're already almost there with a league average quarterback. It's the it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. So while I'm not excited about Carr, um, I don't think anybody should be. It's, it's so weird. It's so weird. Maybe, they're, maybe they have a church and they want him to like come speak to their kids and they're just kissing his ass or something. Because like if they're like a youth pastor or something, you know what I mean? Like aff- affliction with the, you know, let's say <laughs> affliction shirt, uh, uh, you know, uh, lifted truck, uh, camouflage hat. Copenhagen maybe some skull in their lip that's a car fan to me and uh I I don't I don't know why people are so excited about having them again I uh I do see people going crazy like I do see people going crazy against him and and I get it because again it's fun to troll the dumb stands it's super fun but after a while it's like oh god get away from me but I don't think most people think he's the worst quarterback in the league. I don't to, to the people that love Carr, nobody thinks he's the worst quarterback in the league. We're just tired of mediocrity. Okay? The Bills do the same thing with Josh Allen. Their fans are nuts. I, I go on PFF and stuff and I see their fans going insane. And it reminds me of us, like whenever our guys get like a bad grade. And and you know, they're like, fuck this guy. Fuck Tim Kawakami. Fuck I mean, which you know, stuff like that. Josh Allen is like that too because the Bills haven't had a good quarterback since Jim Kelly. So 
they they're like we can't lose Josh Allen because then we might go another twenty years without one. And to me, that's like I mean, not to get dark here, but that's like people who stay with like an abusive partner because they were scared to be homeless. You know what I mean? Like, look, I I I guess I get the logic, right? I get the logic of you'd rather be mediocre than terrible, but uh, I don't. It's not going to end well if you keep. If we're, show me in twenty twenty a, a quarterback that's going to be guaranteed eight years of sub five hundred football with a team. I can't guarantee that for any quarterback. That used to be a thing back in the day. Teams there weren't enough good college quarterbacks. A lot of run run heavy offense, but now quarterbacks don't get this kind of leash. And and look, Gruden, you can blame it on Gruden. We have Gruden. We're we're fucked with Gruden. I mean, I'm not saying we're fucked by being coached by Gruden yet, but we're we're locked into Gruden for at least another seven years real or six years realistically. I would say maybe maybe five years if Mark Davis wants to take a bath on that contract. And maybe maybe the Vegas money situation is going really well, but I don't know. I don't know. So I'd rather at least eventually let Gruden try to get his guy, whether it's a veteran or or because Carr's not it. They're trying. I know they wanted Kyler Murray last year. I I I believe that. And they thought about Dwayne Haskins, but yeah, I'll pass too. But uh, nonetheless, uh, that's gonna do it for me today. Um, it was a good draft. Uh. I don't want people to get too soured on my rant on Carr, but uh, you know, he's average to me, and I want I want to be better. I don't want to waste this roster. I don't want to waste these the speed, this these talent, this talent that we just acquired. Um, I saw a Vikings fan, a Vikings fan. It was oh, it was Betts, one of the best followers on Twitter. Love that guy. Um, at all twenty two, he said. Like he posted a thing of a guy in a Kermit the Frog costume, just like slumped shoulders, looking sad, and he said like the Vikings crushed the draft, but then I remembered we have Kirk cousins and like, I, I kind of felt that a bit today. Now I don't think Carr's going to get wide receivers killed. That's stupid. Anyone who's saying that is dumb. This, this speed should help him more than anything. Rugs doesn't run a lot of deep routes. So what? Hey, get him the ball on a three yard slant. See what he can do with it. That's the reason he has that speed, right? So it's time to put up or shut up. It's time to win this year. I expect them to win this year. I know the coronavirus thing. Maybe that's going to be another car excuse is the coronavirus. Don't be surprised if the stands use the coronavirus as an excuse. I'm just saying. They've used a lot crazier excuses than that. But uh, overall, I thought we got better. I thought we got better this weekend. Um, it was worth the wait. Now we don't get sports anymore. The NFL did the just the tip with us. We don't get the rest of it till whenever, right? Uh, yeah, so everybody stay safe, um, at Glenn Rockney on Twitter. Um, I'm going to definitely, uh, take a few day break from doing some Raider podcasts. I don't, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of news, uh, unless we get like Yannick or something Then I'm back, but probably take a couple days off here after doing three straight. And, uh, I do have another podcast that I do. Um, it's, uh, a leftist politics podcast, uh, leftist, not liberal, uh, look up the difference before you listen, <laughs> if you don't want to get pissed off. But, uh, it's leftist politics theme, but I just talk shit on there with my with my boy Crypto Psy at Crypto PSI. So um, subscribe to Rare Candy on iTunes, and uh, that's where this podcast is posted. However, I am creating my own Rock Vegas Raiders theme. It's being approved right now by iTunes. Hopefully, then I will have our own stream for our, the fucking people that don't like leftist politics because uh, football is definitely – football is kind of a breeding ground for a bunch of different – political theories and you might not want to hear my politics i understand i'd still rather have you listen to this this broadcast or whatever the hell this is called podcast broadcast what am i 100 but um yeah subscribe to rare candy on itunes it's, you'll see the rc old school rc cola logo that we've turned into rare candy and then i'm at glenn rockney on twitter if this is your first time listening thank you uh to all the people like uh at oakland 627 eric uh thanks for all the promotion and uh, and zach out there too Thank, thanks for helping me uh, get this off the ground, guys. Uh, it was a good draft and definitely a lot of fun talking about it. Stay safe, guys.